it's not maybe a gap, but maybe, you know, a lacuna that we could fill and we are filling and that's, uh, we're making and building bridges between translators and academics here. I am definitely from the academic side. I am, um, my name is Nicole Willock and I am moderating this panel on, um, on uh, the Italian pun, if I can pronounce it correctly, traditur traditor, I think something like that, which basically means translation and treason. So we're gonna get into some of the really nitty gritty, um, fun sort of stuff today. And I think we have, um, I think our panel is going to build up more examples of a lot of the theoretical um, issues that were brought up um, by David, uh, Professor Bellos this morning and also by um, this morning's panel on theory and praxis. So I'm very interested to see how, you know, these kind of real practical um, moments in time um, develop. And so, yeah, I come from, I did um, my PhD at Indiana University. I graduated three years ago and I'm now assistant professor at Old Dominion University. And um, I think my area of specialty is 20th century China. I actually work on monastic scholars within China, um, state in Shapchong. Um, Jigme Rikpe Lobchu was my um, dissertation topic and I'm continuing that forward. So that's that's just my brief introduction. But um, I think far more interesting is going to be our, our discussion here. So I wanted to, um, we're going to do it a slightly different um, order um, than this morning, just to let you guys know. Um, uh, but uh, Gavin Kilty will speak uh, first, and then Catherine Dalton, and then Tyler Dewar, and then uh, Tom Tillemans will be speaking. And I will briefly introduce each speaker before they speak, and then I'm going to be posing them a question. Um, we've been working on these questions for, I don't know, back and forth, like kind of the whole summer. Um, Jose Cabazon originally was going to be on our panel as well. But that did, um, for he had commitments um, at, at his work and was unable to be here. So it's the four of us, or five of us. So um, uh, Gavin Kilty will kick off our discussion uh, today. And um, I think many of you know Gavin, and he's worked as a full-time uh, translator for Chupta Jimpa's Library of Tibetan Classics um, since 2000. And he has numerous translations. And you can refer to all of this information also in the program book. I just want to remind everybody of that. So I'm going to kick off with a question to Gavin on what is the role of the translator in terms of their allegiance? How much should the final product of the process of translation be determined by the original thoughts of the author and how much by the needs and characteristics of the target audience? Thank you, Nicole. Um, also, I'd like to echo what Nicole said. Thanks very much to Sadra you know, for putting on this conference and for inviting me. Um, before I start, th this morning a couple of people told h how or why they got into translation and when they said that it kind of sparked in me my reason and I'd just like to briefly mention that because I think it has some kind of relation to, uh, to what I'm going to talk about. So it was in, in the uh, um, late 80s when we had come back from India and uh, s spent our time wandering around uh, trying to find a, some kind of meaningful existence back in the West. And anyway, I went to this festival. It was a standard sort of festival. And at this festival, there was a friend of mine. And uh, he was um, quite a colorful character. His name was Shivam O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> he was Irish, you know, O'Brien. And he uh, obviously had a great love of, uh, of, uh, of Shivam, hence the name Shivam O'Brien. But he was also a shaman. So he had all these things going for him. <laughs> and um, he... Um, he was performing, and he was on stage. He was on stage with them. Um, he had uh, someone playing didgeridoo and someone on keyboards, and uh, he was reciting. And he said, "I'm going to tell you the story of Angulimala, and uh, you know the Buddhist serial killer." <laughs> and and um, I said, "Okay, well, we all know this story." And so, to the accompaniment of didgeridoo and keyboards, he's, he told this in kind of semi-verse, semi-prose sort of style way. And I was mesmerized. It was as if I'd never heard the story before. I know, we all know the story. It was as if I'd never heard it before. I thought, wow, he made it so, I know, I can't say ins inspirational, I guess, and vivid and alive. You know, and at that moment, I remember, I, I remember thinking, about, oh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to translate. Um, Mainly, if I was thinking in terms of verse, devotional verse, and uh, try and bring it to uh, you know an audience, and maybe try and make it inspirational, inspiring like that. 
So that's how I, I began. And I, I first started with Dos en Lune, you know, Sutra of the Wise and the Foolish. It didn't get published. And then I went on to um, some verses by Jason Carper, 21 verses by Jason Carper, because I wanted to show that he was more than a philosopher, that he was a brilliant poet and a great faith and devotion. So that's, that's how I began. And uh, so I don't know, maybe the role of the translator, maybe one of the roles is to inspire the audience. Maybe, I don't know. Anyway, what I was going to say is this. Um, in 2011, at the uh, Tengyur Translation Conference in Sarnath, and then I think many of you were there, one speaker stood up and said something along the lines of the following. One single Tibetan text, one single Tibetan text should be, not could be, but should be translated in a variety of ways according to the designated target audience, readership uh, audiences. Which means that he, there would be multi-translations of one text. There wouldn't be one base translation from which all these other translations come, but a series of different translations. And the differences between each of the translations would be determined by who, by the characteristics or the needs of the uh, intended recipients. That's what he said. Now, I remember having a very visceral gut reaction to this. <laughs> um, thinking, I, I, I can't accept this. I found it really, I found, had a strong resistance to this. Now, I'm not saying this, uh, in, in bringing this person up because I want to set up some kind of opponent or I want to criticize him or find fault. Not that at all, because I do believe that there is a role and what he suggested is valid. But as we're talking about the role of the translator, where does the role of the translator begin? Where does it end? And what goes, and what is beyond the role of the translator? That's why I, I, I'm mentioning it. And so I asked myself, you know, why, why, why do I have this reaction? What, what is it? It wasn't rational, so why do I have it? And I realized it was about allegiance. It was about uh, where, is, where does the allegiance of the translator lie? Does it lie with the author? Does it lie with the, with the, re with the, uh, with the, uh, with the readers? Is it shared between the two? No, and if so, if it's shared, how much with each and, and so forth? And by allegiance, I mean, who, I, I don't mean allegiance in terms of devotion or faith to the particular author in a kind of Buddhist sense. I mean allegiance in the sense of who is the translator serving? Who are they serving? And it is in that sense. And so um, what I want to say is that um, Two things. First of all, everything I'm going to say was already, has already been said this morning. I have to say, I think a lot of the things that were said brilliantly by David Bellis and, and, and also the first panel um, covered what I have to say, and I, I realize that what I've got to say is really rather simplistic and um, maybe rather facile, but I, as I have nothing else to say, I'm going to repeat it anyway, so <laughs> please, please forgive me. The other, the other thing I want to say is I, I am not an academic. I don't, I, I'm not an academic. I don't do, I, have do, I don't research translation. I've never re researched translation. I translate, but I don't research it. So uh, I, I don't have an academic uh, um, perspective on this. So I'm just going to give you my own personal experience of, 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 of translation, and it's not meant to be opinionated or anything like that, but it's just a personal experience, and you can shoot it down and do whatever you like with it. And I'm already, you know, we're only here one day, and already I'm starting to have a few doubts and thoughts in my head for listening to all these wonderful people here. So, anyway, my idea, uh, an, an example, in terms of this allegiance, this allegiance question is, um, I could give you an example. Take a classical musician, a pianist, okay, playing a bit of Mozart or something like that, yeah, a bit of Mozart. What that pianist has in front of them is a notation, score sheet, on which is simply black marks on white paper, no notes. From that, he or she has to reproduce, recreate at that moment, the music that flowed through the mind of Mozart all those years ago. That's his task, that's his her or task, to reproduce that. Mozart had music in his head, 
He wrote it down using notation. And that manuscript, musical manuscript, was carried over time, centuries, to the present time. And now this pianist's job is to recreate that. And how does he do that? How did I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm using he. How does he or she do that? They have a skill. The pianist has a skill. He's learnt his craft, his trade, he can play the piano. But more than that, hopefully, they have been mentored in the, uh, in the particular classical music tradition, and maybe he has read the line, he's studied Mozart himself. As Jimbo was saying this morning, how important it is to know the person you're translating. So he, he will have, he will be, he will be mentored in a particular tradition. He will have the skill. It's just not enough to know how to play the piano. That's not enough. It's more than that. Then with that, you know, he has in front of him an audience. So he has a duty to them also. He has a duty to provide, a, uh, they've paid money to come and see him. He has to provide a good, you know, concentrated, diligent, he mustn't be sloppy, he must put his effort into it, he must put his heart and soul, his emotions, everything, put everything into producing a good performance. That is his task, that is his job, that is his responsibility, right? Now, if he, um, if he thinks to himself, well, I don't know, this audience looks a little bit uh, restless or maybe they don't quite understand uh, uh, classical music, maybe I should just... Uh, Maybe I should just uh, change it a bit. Or maybe I should leave out a few notes. Maybe I should just jazz it up a bit and make it a little bit more accessible to the audience. And he starts, you know, which has been done. If he did that, I think it's pretty obvious that he would, um, you know, receive censure and criticism from his peers, quite rightly so. So he doesn't do that. It has been done, and there's a purpose, there's a need for that. But he doesn't do that. It goes beyond his responsibility, his allegiance lies with Mozart to recreate, to bring that music of Mozart, you know, his fingers, if these were the fingers of Mozart, what would they play? How would they play it? it that, I think, is his... Um <coughs> so I think translator is similar, the same. I mean, it, it's their duty to somehow recreate the original thoughts of insights of the, uh, of the Tibetan author and bring it as best as they can to a modern audience. The, their allegiance so is, is, like, is similar to the, to the musician. And in that sense, that kind of allegiance to the author is not something that is born out of an obsession with tradition or... Uh, an obsession with being pure, you know, the, the purity, you know, we must keep it pure, you know, mustn't diverge, or an unwillingness to embrace modern thinking. Not, not, not that. It's not born out of that. It's born out of this sense of, sorry, this sense of allegiance, and which, and, but, and it's allegiance, it is, it is the translator's responsibility. I talked about that this morning. Responsibility, duty, task. We're talking about serving. People who serve have responsibilities, they have duties, they have tasks. It is their responsibility their ta to do that. So that's what I, 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 I mean um, uh, um, by allegiance. And also another way is that I, I think that the, the process of translation itself somehow determines this allegiance to the author. Because um, if you think about it, um, uh, we look at a piece of Tibetan text, and this is really very rough and general, and having heard what's been said this morning, I realize it's very simplistic. But the translator asks, if this author was speaking English, what would they say? Brother David mentioned this this morning. What would they say? Right? And once that is, uh, that, that, that kind of, that kind of, that kind of, uh, that answer is then carried over. The word translation is the word trans. Something is, is carried over, uh, over time, over culture, and over language to the present time. So what is carried over into, into the present mm, translation, right? 
is very much, owes, very, owes almost everything to the translator's allegiance to the author, because they bring something over. Now, I know that's very simplistic, because it ignores all the complexities of, of translations, you know, such as things, such as um, things we're talking about this morning, about words that are untranslatable, or, or especially things like monastic manuals, things like Dura, uh, Tarik, Lorik, and these things, which are, have their own terminology. I realize it ignores that. But generally speaking, the idea of finding an equivalent and carrying it over and delivering it like the musician does, you know, that process. And if you look at that process in, in, in more detail, the, um, the translator has the text before him. That text was conceived in Tibetan. The author conceived their thoughts in Tibetan, wrote them down in, on Tibetan text. That text was preserved and carried through the centuries and is now in front of the author, in front of the translator in Tibetan. So it seems to me fairly obvious that the, the, Tibetan, the translator must understand the text in Tibetan, first of all. With no, no English, nothing. Uh, they, they put on their Tibetan hat. They must understand what has been written in, in Tibetan. What I do, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that you do this, but what I do, I always read out aloud, and I then will go through it and I, using colloquial language. I try and imagine I'm some kind of geshe or someone mm -hmm. trying to understand it, you know, and then going through it, talking about it, using colloquial language to, uh, to understand it, to connect this, to connect that, and this relates to that, and this relates to that, you know. And until finally some kind of understanding dawns in me. That understanding is that dawns is not in English. It's a kind of a... It's a kind of me mental abstract. It's a, it's a construct uh, of... Uh, yeah, it's a construct. And that comes about through... Uh, I find very helpful to sort of discuss things with myself. <laughs> well, yeah, no. My wife is downstairs, and I'm you're always talking to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. What are you doing? No. So, um, I, it, it's, it's also another reason why I believe translators must know colloquial language. So important, you know, I think it really is important. Just knowing classical is not enough. And once that understanding has been gained, then you take off the Tibetan hat, put on your Western hat, and you bring that, that construct that don't she over and then you've got to deliver it into the western language then you say goodbye to all the tibetan now you become a western english uh, native speaker now comes your consideration of the audience the being kind to the reader right and i i think as uh, as also i think jimba said you know we our duty to the uh, to the to the readership is that we deliver in, with good grammar, with good syntax, the punctuation, paragraphs where there were none in Tibetan, you know? headings that have been need to be fleshed out, footnotes, um, glossaries, bibliography, introduction, front matter, back matter, good editing, you know, all these things. This is this is where our, this is the duty to the uh, our duty to the. Um, to the audience, the same way the musician's duty is to the, to the audience, yeah? And there, I think, the translator's role ends. As a translator, I'm not saying that it couldn't... Anyway, the translator, the strict meaning of the word translator, I think their role ends there. They've done their job. They've done their task. You know, I always think translate, translation is a service industry, isn't it? It is a service industry, it's, you know, it, it delivers a product. Translators are like waiters in a restaurant. <laughs> they bring the, the chef, is the author, they bring the food to the customers. They don't tell the customers how to eat it, <laughs> right? Or how they should enjoy it or anything like that. That's not their job. Their job is to deliver it, you know, and say anything else, sir, and then walk away. And I, I, I think that our... Our job is that too, you know. You know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, we are not here to convert people. 
You know, and, and Buddhists don't convert, and Buddhist translators even less, I think. We're not here to convert. We, we present. Here it is. Enjoy. You know, it's, it's there. I, and I think so. I think the role of the translator ends, ends there. Um, um, <laughs> this Italian uh, um, translation is betrayal, treason something like that. I know what it means, and we, we, I think that was touched on this morning, that you can never ever get a kind of perfect translation. No. I have to say, I'm not 100% sure that that is right. I think it's an ideal that we should aim for. If we say, oh, well, it's never going to be right, then you're kind of self-limiting, isn't it? I think it is an ideal. I think there is, there is in the future a perfect translation just waiting to happen, you know. <laughs> and maybe... One, one of us in this room will we'll, we'll do it. <laughs> but surely we've got to have that goal, huh? that it is possible, you know. And I, some, I can't remember, someone said something this morning that, uh, and that um, maybe it was on the board, I don't know. I, I think it's possible. Anyway, if, um, talking about this betrayal, if the translator, like, like the musician, start, who jazzes up, isn't it? if the translator... Am I running out of time? You've got a, a minute. Okay, I got a minute. Yeah. If the translator, if the translator goes, starts um, tinkering around and, uh, and sort of uh, um, playing with the with the translation for for the sake of the audience, isn't that a betrayal? Isn't that a betrayal of the author? Or isn't it? I mean, I, I'm not saying it is, but it, it seems like it could be. And finally, one last thing. In the same conference in 2011, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who was a guest there, said, we should take the, the tenets or the philosophy of Buddhism out of its Buddhist clothing and deliver it to the West. He mentioned Chandrakirti. So he, he said, you should take, say, the Majamaka philosophy of Chandrakirti out, out, of, out, out of its Buddhist milieu and present it to the West. And that may well, I think that may well be the way forward. And he has, an, of course, initiated a project to do just that. So that seems to me like uh, a, a form of, it's not translation, in, 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 but it is transmission. And I think, going back to the original, that speaker who suggested multi-translation, that seems perfectly valid as, as a form of transmission, that one can do that. But in terms of what is the role, I'm being, I know I'm being strict, the role of the translator, I don't think these things are translation. So, um, you know, I think uh, all, trans all transmission, translation, translation is transmission. But not all, not all transmission is translation. Okay, that's all I have to say. I'm sorry I was talking so much. Thank you. Thank you. Gavin, you're not quite off the hook because um, remember we're going to do some questions between us panelists um, now. So, um, uh, but I, w I was curious if any one of you um, had a follow-up question for Gavin that you would like to ask. I'd like to explore that. Uh, I don't know where this, uh, whether this will take us further down the road or not, but for the sake of fun, uh, I'd like to explore the music analogy. Mm -hmm. You know, because. Uh, what came to my mind is Stanley Jordan. Uh, Stanley Jordan, he's a guitar player. He oh. plays this kind of tapping style of guitar. Uh -huh. He's a jazz player mostly, jazz, blues. <laughs> Stanley Jordan is a, is a guitarist. He said bass player. Uh, electric guitar. <laughs> you might be thinking of Stanley Clark. Yeah, yeah Stanley yeah. Clark. So, but I'm talking about Stanley Jordan, who does. <laughs> <laughs> he's a guitar player, by the way. <laughs> Um, he does a beautiful arrangement of Mozart on his guitar, but in a very bluesy, jazzy style. Mm. But in a way that you can definitely, when you listen to mm. it, when you yeah, listen, even the, from the first notes, you know that it's Mozart. Mm. But then he throws this jazziness in, and you're like, ooh. <laughs> actually, <laughs> listening to Stanley Jordan makes me want more Mozart. Okay, but yeah. That, but that's listening to a classical arrangement of Mozart, I still have yet to develop a taste for that. Um, so could that... Could that be analogous to translators finding like idiomatic ways mm. to to deliver the same type of content? Yeah, I, I think so. Mm -hmm. I think it's quite possible. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I was talking about the 
Another thing I was thinking of, you know, is like um, if you take the blues. Yeah. Let's 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 turn this into a music session, right? Yeah. If you take you take the blues. You know, the blues, the pure blues, are going to be were found in the cotton fields and down in the southern states, right? You know, and then hey, white boy comes along, right, and turns it into rock and roll. Okay. Now, the rock and roll ain't the blues, right? But it, it, it comes from that, and, and because rock and roll was so popular, it, it brought all these old blues singers and gave them a platform and an audience that they wouldn't have not normally had. So there is, you know, there is a, I think there's a, certainly a value to that, to doing that. But I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm just old. <laughs> Old-fashioned or something like that. But I, 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 I don't want to do that. Uh -huh. I personally don't want to do that. And, but, you know, and I, I did say at the beginning, this is my own personal view. You know, um, of course it can be done. Of course it can be done. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And why not? But I do say, you know, again, it, it is, you know, it, are we translating to spread the Dharma? If we're translating to spread the Dharma, are we then trying to convert? Is there a difference between spreading and propagating the Dharma and converting others. I'm not. I think there is a difference. I think you can spread as your duty, duty to the Buddha Dharma, or to your gurus. You know, who you, that's your duty to to spread it. But it's not your duty to convert. You spread it and say, here it is. It's up to you whether you take it on board. I th we're gonna. Um, I have one more question on the just to kind of follow up, and I think this can be open to all the panelists. But maybe um, some of you have seen um, Joshua Bell perform in a subway station in New York City. Joshua Bell, of course, is one of the most famous violinists in the world, um, and everyone ignored him. Um, right. Basically, kept walking past him. It was a pretty uh, publicized event, and then um, Joshua Bell decided afterwards that perhaps um, playing in the subway station wasn't the most appropriate venue for him to be playing the violin. So what he did is in Washington, D.C. about three days ago, um, he organized a performance at the subway station with um, students who were at the Conservatory of Music and so on in order to, you know, both bring um, classical music to the public sphere, but also, um, you know, really make it available to everybody. And what happened was that he became kind of a rock star. Um, <laughs> there were, like, young teenage girls kind of, you know, clawing at him and things like that. So. I, I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you can find that happy medium that perhaps, you know, that's really what does make it kind of popular. And I just, I don't know if any one of you have comments on that, but I was just curious. Ta Tom? Oh, I don't have any comments on that, no. Perhaps <laughs> 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 so we'll move on. Well, the translator, I think, the, the translator often, like, uh, I would say, I would guess that a high percentage of the people who are translators in this room also consider themselves teachers or uh, wind up in roles of teaching when people kind of pull them off to the sidelines and saying, I didn't get this part, then they have to explain it in the same way that if you're serving food that's meant to be consumed in a certain way, you might have to tell them, you might have to give some advice about how it's eaten. Oh, actually, what, how this is done is you actually tear off a piece of the bread and you, you pick up the vegetables with your hands. You know, that's the way mm -hmm. they do this. And then the person feels licensed to do it in the way that it's traditionally done, you know? Yeah. Uh, but then, I guess, mindfulness of stepping into a different role, like I'm, I'm, I'm actually teaching now mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah. I'm no longer translating. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And that's not something that normally... I think happens in the context of actually doing a textual translation or as an oral interpreter. I, f I agree with you, Gavin, actually, that there is a place where the translator role does end. And I feel, for me, that it's important to respect that particular boundary. But, you know, and when you said most of us probably are also teachers, I thought, no way. And then you said, but then people pull you on the sidelines and ask you a question. And yes, they do, all the time. What did Rinpoche mean when he said that? Well, I can't presume to tell you what he meant, but how I interpret it is like this. And, and, you, and then that answer is actually tailored to that particular individual and what you think, how you think that person might be able to receive those, those words. But that's a different context, I think, because it's in that particular context of being asked by an individual what a teacher meant, which you are, I think, often as an oral interpreter especially. Um, that's a, it's, a, it's an individual setting, and so it's a, one is able to tailor one's words in a more individual way, which is different than translating, I, I feel. And what a perfect segue to our next question. 
Um, Catherine Dalton is our second speaker today. Um, Catherine has been working on um, as an oral interpreter um, since 2003 and a textual translator for the Dharma Chakra um, Translation Committee since 2005. She's recently a um, PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. Congratulations, Catherine. That's wonderful. And, um, and she also regularly serves as Choki Nima Rinpoche's oral interpreter in the US. And so she's going to be um, segueing into this topic that's been raised a few times, I think, with the question um, this morning on um, the role of the oral interpreter. So what is the role of the oral interpreter and how is this you know, similar or different from the, te the textual translator? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to first begin by saying that it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be here among so many of my distinguished colleagues, most of whom are my senior colleagues, despite the fact that I myself have been translating for more than 10 years. So that's, I think, um, says something about what Sadra has been able to do in gathering this group here. Um, I wanted to address the topic of our panel, which is the role of the translator, in terms of the specific context of oral interpreters for Dharma teachings, um, for a number of reasons. One, because several of us here on the panel also serve as oral interpreters for Tibetan teachers, and also because of the larger topic of the conference, which is translation and transmission. And I think that spoken Dharma teachings, oral Dharma teachings, are an incredibly important part of that process of transmission, and therefore the role of the oral interpreter in that process is also a very important thing to consider. Um, I find it a little bit amusing that I'm on a panel entitled Tradutore Tradutore because I uh, learned Tibetan initially precisely because I did not trust the treachery of translation and I wanted access to Tibetan Buddhist teachings in the original language. I had no intention whatsoever of becoming a traitorous translator. <laughs> Um, and I only became such, I, I, I started working as an oral interpreter for very practical reasons. And I did that actually, I worked as an interpreter for a number of years before I ever did any textual translation that I showed anyone besides my roommates. <laughs> um, but the, the practical context that I was in is I was living in Nepal, I was studying in Ashadra, the program was expanding and there was a need for more interpreters. I could mostly understand the Kempos and I was asked to try. And it turned out that I was able actually to take on that role and it's something that I have uh, enjoyed and been so grateful to have the opportunity to do since then. Um, but because of that, I think because my initial um, interaction with or engagement with interpreting came in such a practical context, I personally have not really uh, thought so much about translation in a theoretical way. I've not studied uh, translation theory, perhaps to my peril. Um, I think it's interesting and I, I would like to study more, but for those reasons, um, I would like to speak today a little bit more from a practical perspective and in terms of my own personal experience rather than theoretically about the practice of oral interpreting. I think that the most basic and most obvious role of the oral interpreter in the context of a Dharma teaching um, is to convey to the listeners, to convey to the audience, the content of the Dharma teacher's speech. Um, the meaning, the words of that speaker, and to use a, a word that came up in the context of conversation with Tom yesterday that I thought was very helpful, the truth value, actually, of the content of that speaker's words. And sometimes we make a distinction between a more literal style of translation or a more meaning-oriented style of translation. The Tibetan tradition speaks about a tigur versus a tungur in terms of a textual translation. But I think that it's not always necessary to really think of those two things as being quite in, in opposition to one another. Um, I feel that for an oral interpreter as well as a textual translator that the um, main focus actually, or the main role is to convey the meaning or the truth value, if you will, of the content of what is being translated. Um, and of course also to maintain, to do that in a way that follows a style and a syntax that's natural in the target language. But I personally, as a an oral interpreter, tend to stick as close as possible, to provide as close as possible a rendering of the words of the teacher as I can. And you know, that's actually different when I do textual translation. I, I feel like I have a little bit more uh, license, actually, as a textual translator somehow. And I'm, I'm, but I, as an oral interpreter, I feel that to the extent possible, 
I want to replicate the words of the teacher as long as that doesn't get in the way of conveying the meaning. And of course, sometimes it does. In that case, it's not possible to do it that way. But I also recognize that that's my personal style and um, it's my inclination. And I'm not at all sure that there's somehow a right way of interpreting, a right way of translating. Um, there are a number of translators who I consider to be absolute masters of the craft and who are much uh, less literal than I personally tend to be, including people who I consider to be my teachers because I have learned from them through their example over the years. So I think it's actually very important to acknowledge that it's possible for there to be a number of different styles and that each individual translator, each individual interpreter will develop his or her own style. And that's something that we can um, celebrate, actually, rather than criticize. Um, again, this is actually something a little bit along the lines of what Gavin was just mentioning, but I think part of what the role of the interpreter is not is to add much, if anything at all, beyond what the teacher has said. And that is to say, an interpreter is not a commentator on the teacher's words. Um, although one time when I was translating for a lama, uh, one of his uh, attending mon monks came up to me, and I'm actually not going to identify either the lama or the attendant <laughs> in this context, but he said to me, Catherine, the attendant said, uh, Rinpoche's teaching is gonna be like the root terma, and your translation needs to be like the commentary. <laughs> And that teacher is known for being, uh, actually this attendant was only half joking. Um, that teacher is in particular known for being a little bit terse from time to time. But I, I didn't actually follow his joking suggestion because one, um, there's this question that I don't exactly feel qualified to comment on Rimche's root terma, uh, his speech, but also I, don't, I think that's not my role actually as an interpreter to go beyond, to say something beyond what the teacher himself has said. Um, in addition to conveying the content of the actual teaching that is being delivered, I think an interpreter also should convey the tone or the flavor of the teacher's words. And this is connected to another part of the interpreter's role, which I think applies in a different way to an oral interpreter than it does to a textual translator. And that's the responsibility to speak in a way that's actually engaging to the audience, to speak in a way that maintains the attention of the audience. And this can be a little bit tricky because the focus of the teaching should always be on the teacher. It should never be on the interpreter. It can't be too captivating. But that said, I do think it's important to be engaging as an interpreter. And in, in my personal experience, um, I am one of Chukinima Rinpoche's interpreters, and he does go on at length. Sometimes he will speak for 20, 30 minutes without pausing for the interpreter to speak. And so in that context, I feel that I have to speak in a way that actually holds the attention of the people who've been waiting for half an hour to hear what Rinpoche has been saying. Uh, and conveniently, he himself speaks in a very engaging way in Tibetan, so I simply feel that I'm just replicating his own way of delivering to the extent that I can when I do that in English. Um, this is also a little bit connected to the issue that I think Tyler is going to be speaking about here in just a moment, which is the question of the visibility or the invisibility of the translator. An oral interpreter, I think, is necessarily more visible in some sense than a textual translator, namely because she's usually physically visible, or at least you hear her voice or hear his voice. Um, then, and that's not the case for a textual translator, but for me, actually, the most beautiful translation is one in which the interpreter is somehow invisible, um, in which it actually feels as if the teacher is speaking in the target language, which is for me is often English, and um, I'm not trying to deny the agency of the interpreter in making that happen. It actually involves a lot of skill to speak in a way in which one renders oneself invisible to the extent possible. Um, but I do, for me, that is an ideal. And I will admit that I have occasionally had the fantasy of translating from behind a screen like the Wizard of Oz or in a burqa, or, but somehow I don't think that's how that particular aim is achieved. <laughs> um, another part of the interpreter's responsibility, I think, is to ensure the confidence of both the teacher and the audience. Uh, when a teacher is confident in his or her translator, 
it is it shows in the fluidity and the ease of the teaching. I personally have been in both situations, one in, when the teacher is confident in me and also in the situation where the teacher was not confident in me and it it affects the teaching so much. And so I feel it's a very important part of the responsibility of the interpreter to do whatever is possible to ensure the confidence of the teacher. And one way of doing that, or one part of that, is actually just the relationship between the teacher and the interpreter. Um, I'm sure all of you know how beautiful it is sometimes to receive a teaching from a teacher who has a really close relationship with his or her translator. It's, uh, it's actually it's a part of the teaching context, and just to see that teacher-student relationship conveyed in um, the, the translation itself. And I know that from my own experience, it's a completely different experience to a translate for my own teacher, uh, for other teachers with whom I have a very close relationship than it is to translate for someone who I don't really know. And that's obviously tangible. It's felt in the audience. I know that from having been on both sides. Um, Another part, uh, well, ensuring the confidence of the, the audience uh, is also really important. And part of that is just speaking confidently, but it's not just that. Another part is um, that I think students, an audience, is confident when they feel they're understanding what's happening. And so the translator, the interpreter, has actually the responsibility, I think, to look out and see if people are understanding and see what is working in terms of particular turns of phrase and what is not working in terms of particular turns of phrase for what people are receiving and to be somewhat adaptable, of course, within the context of remaining loyal to what the teacher is saying. You know, you can't go beyond that. Um, and in the end then, uh, this is again related to what Gavin was just saying, to whom is the interpreter actually ultimately responsible? Um, and I agree with Gavin here, actually for me, I think that my ultimate responsibility as an oral interpreter is to the teacher. Now, as a Dharma practitioner, um, I see translation and interpreting as part of my own practice. And in particular, when I am interpreting for my own teacher, that is an offering, that is a service to him. And so in that sense, I really do feel ultimately responsible to him. But I also think it's important to acknowledge that part of the responsibility to the teacher is a responsibility to convey his or her words and meaning in a way that it can be appreciated and received well by the audience. And so in that sense, the interpreter is actually equally responsible to the teacher and to those who are receiving the teachings. Um, actually, you know, I feel a little bit like, a little bit less of a traitor when I work as an oral interpreter than I do when I work as a textual translator. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, one, I think, is because there are fewer instances in the spoken language when the beauty and the nuance of the words just simply can't make it into another language. I, for me, that seems to happen more frequently when I'm working with texts than I'm when I'm working with a teacher. Um, secondly, when interpreting for a teacher, some of the communication, a lot of the communication is happening without me. It's happening directly between the teacher and the audience. And yes, the interpreter has a role in that, but there is already some communication happening. So I guess the responsibility is not quite, it's not so much, a, it's a less heavy burden in some sense. Um, another thing is that for me as an interpreter, there is, I have more confidence in having understood the meaning of what I'm trying to convey because I can just ask if I didn't get it and be reasonably sure that he knew what he meant and he's going to tell me, or if he didn't know what he meant, like uh, to Jimbo I was saying this morning, sometimes th someone didn't know what they meant, but if you ask them, they have the chance to reconsider and then they could come up with something coherent and tell you, and then you translate that, and I just, I feel more confident in having understood, because the kind of text that I personally translate um, no matter how many Kembos and Lamas I ask questions to about certain passages, sometimes it just remains opaque. And I feel that that's less, it happens less when I'm working as an interpreter. Um, and finally, as an interpreter, I have the chance to see the students, the audience actually receiving, and you can look in someone's face and tell whether or not they're understanding what you're saying. And so I have the chance to see that actually the meaning is being conveyed, that my role is actually working, that the function is taking place, and that's a luxury that you don't have very often as a textual translator. And so I guess uh, while 
of course, there is always something lost in translation, if you will. Um, I f my personal sense is that when it is done well, there is a little bit somehow less lost in the context of oral interpreting than there is in textual translation. And for that reason, I feel that spoken Dharma, teach Dharma teachings are such a crucial and important component of the transmission of the Dharma into the West. Again, we have like a, a minute or two among the panelists to respond to Catherine, um, if anyone would like to say something. Um, uh, yeah, a couple of things. Uh, one thing, uh, summarizing. Quite often, a, uh, I don't know, in, when I've in interpreted, um, the teacher repeats. Yeah. Uh, they'll say it extensively, then should, you know, like this. And so, I remember once a couple of... Uh, students uh, came up, I think it was me or somebody, and said, <clears throat> the Lama spoke for five minutes, you only spoke for three. <laughs> Therefore, you're leaving something out. Mm -hmm. Now, I suspect that it was a summarizing issue. Mm -hmm. So um, how, how do you deal with yeah, that? That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I, if the Lama repeats, I repeat. Uh, I know that everyone doesn't do that, and I respect that everyone doesn't do that. I respect that people have different styles. But I personally, um, I guess there's something less polished about a spoken context than there is about a written context, and I like to preserve that. Uh, I like to let the audience hear as much as possible what I heard in the way that I heard it. And um, also I think that teachers sometimes repeat for a reason, like they wanted you to hear it three times because they knew you wouldn't get it the first time. For me, I don't always get it, I often I probably don't get it the first time. So. I, I like to preserve that, but that's just, I don't think it's wrong not to. That's just how I like to do it. But it, it yeah, interesting question. Is it? Yeah, no, we have a minute or two. For oh, we do? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think we're getting a quite conservative picture of translation. I think maybe I'll just to provoke things, go the other way. <laughs> um, yeah, and <laughs> yeah. Uh, the. If we take with Gavin and with um, Catherine, the key terms are, you know, come re representing faithfully equivalences and so forth, Tran not getting in the way, um, allegiances and so forth. Now, if we contrast that with another thing, which it was a, a small remark which Tupten Jimpa made, which was sometimes people don't know what they're saying, yeah. and we tell them what they say. Yeah. Um, that's the other extreme, obviously. Mm -hmm. But it is something which happens. And let's just look a little bit at the logic of what it is to say something or think something. This is the question of propositional attitudes. I say that P, right? I think that P. Now, the P, the proposition there, may be a duplication of what the person, in a sense, has going on in their heads, their internal dialogue. That's a certain type of faithfulness. But I don't think we can restrict ourselves only to that kind of imperative of, to, of, of faithfulness. Sometimes we have to put it in our terms, and in terms which he or she may never have thought of. Now that, I suspect, it comes uh, very strongly in written translation, but it also comes uh, in the case of oral translation, too. Let's take, for example, to take a case of written translation. It, it, it especially comes when you're dealing with technical terms. Let's suppose we say, does Nagarjuna recognize the law of double negation elimination? Does Nagarjuna recognize contraposition? Does he recognize the law of non-contradiction? I deliberately take technical stuff. What did Chandrakirti mean by teldo, prasanga viparyaya? Did he just mean turning around the absurdity? No, or did he mean contraposition, like we mean it, right? Now, I think we can contribute something to the discussion in that particular case by saying Chandrakirti actually did mean contraposition, and Nagarjuna did or did not. Could you gloss contraposition what, briefly, Tom? Oh, uh, let's suppose I say, uh, uh, if P, then Q, right? Then from not Q, we can infer not P, uh -huh. okay? In other words, if it's raining, then the streets are wet. Uh, the streets aren't wet, so it's not raining. 
And could okay. you give an example of how I that would did. differ from, no, no, how it would differ from just flipping the consequence? Oh, well, that's a complicated, we have to get into the first chapter of Prasanna Pada. I wouldn't, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and, and it's actually a dispute that I have with Rueg. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it, uh, it's not worth it. Um, but, uh, not worth the time. But um, the point of it all is, that I'm trying to say, is that one of the things that we do when we represent a person's thought at least in certain, in certain contexts, and it is living dangerously, I agree, um, is we put it in terms which they themselves may never even have heard of, for example, contraposition or double negation elimination, or which sometimes they might actually vociferously deny. So there is a sense in which faithfulness at a particular point, becomes a much, much more complex phenomenon. Uh, I, there's a, a number of classical examples of this type of thing. I, I mentioned one the, the other day. Uh, he thinks, Gavin thinks his yacht is longer than it is. Now, Gavin doesn't have in his mind, he doesn't have the proposition, my yacht is longer than it is. I know that his yacht is longer than what he thinks it is. You see? <laughs> Or Gavin or someone else thinks that his pregnant girlfriend is a virgin. Uh, <laughs> nobody has. So I told you not to keep, to keep that quiet. <laughs> <laughs> these are banal. These, I didn't invent this example, by the way. Uh, these are banal cases where one has outside information, right? Outside information, which for one reason or another, one thinks to be reliable and pertinent, and one e inserts it into the context of what a person's thought is. And we do do that, okay? Mm -hmm. So I think that, in a sense, the responsibility that we have, if we're talking about being faithful, is not just disappearing, is not just disappearing. Sometimes we actually tell things, uh, we tell the content of the thought in terms where actually we make ourselves known and we assert ourselves as translators. Yeah. and interpreters. And um, another perfect segue. I mean, these panelists are just amazing. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> so Tyler Dewar is going to be our third speaker today. Um, he also works as a translator and um, oral interpreter. And um, he has served as um, one of the English language translators um, uh, for lectures by Dzogchen Ponlap Rinpoche. And he has also served as an English, um, one of the English language translators for His Holiness the 17th Karmapa. Um, so, um, and he is going to illuminate our um, understanding of, um, I guess, you know, to what degree and in what context um, should a translator call attention to their own agency. And so, thank you, and um, thank you very much, uh, fellow translators and friends. Uh, thank you to Sadra for bringing us here. Um, I didn't plan on addressing the topic from this angle so explicitly or, or right off the bat, but it just strikes me in the present moment, as it were, um, that there is a really tricky or very interesting angle of faith and devotion that we can take in our exploration of um, translation. Uh, because surrounded by translators, you know, coming to a conference like this, I th think a lot of you will have a similar experience of usually your work all happens inside your own head. Uh, and not many people around you in the world can really understand what it is that you do. And, and so much of, of the translation work that we do, especially written translation, is just uh, not typing, but thinking about what we might type or thinking about what we have read. Um, and it's so almost, it's very joyful, but also slightly disconcerting to be in a room full of translators where suddenly the tables are turned and everyone around you understands what it is that you do. <laughs> 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 so you don't quite know how to respond. Uh, and I was kind of wrestling with that to myself over the past uh, 24 hours or so. And it made me turn to the seven branch prayer and the act of prostration or expressing veneran, ve uh, uh, veneration. Uh, veneration, yes. Uh, that that is how you, 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 there's something very uh, liberating in the act of veneration in that um, 
you can kind of temporarily disappear into that and not worry about how you're going to hold yourself. Um, uh, so why am I bringing that up in the context of translation? It's because in many cases, uh, we have great faith and devotion toward the authors that we're translating, toward the instructions that we're translating. And um, again, it depends on what the audience is going to be and what the use of the text is going to be. Uh, but sometimes the translator's faith and devotion becomes then an urge to disappear into the wisdom intention of the author. Uh, you know, while the English then just happens. <laughs> without too strong of a sense of independent or separate agency uh, that's taking place at a distance from the text. So we could analyze uh, in, a, in a very interesting way, you know, what degrees of validity there might be, either, either uh, objective validity or, or some type of um, kind of functional uh, use that this act of disappearing does. But it's, it, it becomes a question of how much do we want to be visible in, let's say, written translation for starters. How much do we want to kind of pop our head out of the page and say, I'm here. I'll be serving as your translator today. <laughs> um, and so uh, again, I think that. Um, a lot depends on the intended use of the text, uh, whether the text is intended to be used primarily for religious purposes, for lack of a better term, or whether it's intended to be used for a more scholarly exploration uh, in the context of study uh, and, and more thorough dissection, philosophical dissection of the contents. So, um, and as we heard the Professor Bellos say, you know, in, in some ways, the many of the translation, translations we make, he used the verb purport, they're kind of pretending to be, uh, like just like the root text, or pretending to be a different new version or, or a new printing of the root text. So sometimes that's a very useful posture to adopt as a translator, to try to make yourself as invisible as possible to further, in particular, the faith and devotion of the readers, because if you're always reminding the reader that this text is being translated, um, then it, it depends on the individual tastes of the reader and, and the habits of the reader. Some will be fine with kind of processing that and they're able to dance with it because they're used to it. Some people might feel a little bit impeded because they want to they want to think that they're reading the Buddha's words and they want to have a relationship not with you but with the Buddha when they're, when they're reading their book. Um, so the advantage of trying to hide one's own presence as a third party is that if you're going for a strong hit of faith and devotion, uh, then consciously pretending to not be there um, can have its uh, benefits. But I think, and Tom helped me clarify my understanding of this point yesterday, that even in that kind of context of trying to make oneself invisible, uh, you have to acknowledge that you're in some way pretending, uh, that it's a some way a, a fake or constructed invisibility. Uh, and as long as you're aware that you're, that you're adopting that pretense, then uh, less danger of being confused about the role of your own role as a translator. Uh, now, from the other perspective of making one's presence known, that also has great advantages because it alerts the reader to the fact that this is the subject of decision in many cases of a per an individual person who has their own kind of intellectual climate that they come from and uh, uh, personal approach to language that they come from. And, uh, you know, if you acknowledge that kind of selfhood that's being imposed on the text right from the start, you might give more of a chance for the inter interdependence of the notion of self to shine through. Like you say, I am choosing this term. Um, 
And then the reader says, okay, here's the translator saying in the footnotes, I am translating this term as blank because of this. Then the reader can then more directly make the links, okay, they are translating this term in such a way because uh, as they said before, they are influenced by such and such a teacher uh, or they have studied in such and such a discipline and they have found that this certain word has a, a better range for its purpose here and so on. So by acknowledging your presence, you're kind of more explicitly, in, in some ways it's a little bit more honest of an approach, uh, uh, for lack of a less moralistic term, a more honest of an approach to take uh, because you're just, you're, you're acknowledging very barely the fact, the fact that you are, um, your own opinions and uh, decision making process is a very much part and parcel of the product which is the text that's being read. So another way that translators can acknowledge their agency in a, uh, in a way that's visible but can become invisible if you get used to it is by using square brackets. Um, and this goes back to the notion of like the subunits, you know. If, so if I, if I feel that I have a strong direct reliance on, on some subunit, however I end up identifying that in the text, then that can be typed in English without any brackets. But if I don't have that directly, but it can only infer it hopefully through a reasonable amount of confidence, then I put that in square brackets. That's how I tend to land. And uh, I like that as a mindfulness practice as a translator because if I use the, at least in the earlier drafts, I try to hyper bracket everything that doesn't really have a very direct correlate in the Tibetan. Uh, so sometimes, like for example, I was saying, uh, if you do such and such, you will be born as, and the Tibetan of course says born as, but I was thinking, well, in English, people would probably say reborn more naturally. If, if you do such and such act, then you'll be reborn as blah. It sounds more natural of a construction, but I don't have the re in the Tibetan, so I'm gonna bracketize the re. Uh, so that's a very kind of hypervigilant approach to using brackets, yes? Um, but I like doing that in the early stages of the draft because it's just a mindfulness practice as of I'm trying to keep track of uh, where I have a solid anchoring in the Tibetan and, and exactly where and when I'm relying on my own inference. And then later, if it seems to be on second and third read through, if it seems to be solid, then I start removing some of the brackets and then only use the brackets for things that I, I think I'm doing a kindness to the reader to just let them know uh, I'm pretty sure this is what is being said here, but I just want to let you know I'm adding this part. Um, uh, but, you know, using the brackets is kind of a more visible way of acknowledging one's agency. And then uh, the other kind of just example that I thought of was what type of constructions do we use in our footnotes uh, in terms of translation choices we make. It's an interesting area to explore and I've played around with doing it uh, different ways. Do we use the first person construction a lot saying, I am choosing this because, um, or do we kind of try to hide again and say, this term because of such and such information appears as, <laughs> so that way <laughs> you, you can still use kind of an, technically an active voice construction but you're, you're staying away from the first person, which I, uh, I tend to prefer in, in um, most of the texts that I do just because I'm worried about it becoming the, the me show rather than about the author themselves. Now, I should qualify that though by saying that I'm mostly translating in what you could loosely call a religious context, that, that, that the translations that I produce, I try to make them as scholarly as possible uh, for a non-academic and I try to you know, include as much useful information and, and cross-references and so forth as I can in the footnotes, but you know, I'm, I'm definitely not bringing on the full array of, of uh, scholarly apparatus that you would find in academia to accompany the translation. Um, so it, it's kind of the translations that I make are, I guess you could say, oriented toward either practitioners or people who want to become, who might become interested in practicing Buddhism uh, as, a, as a method of working with their mind. Um, and something that could then be useful for scholars and academics um, 
but not served as, a, as a necessarily an offering within the academic context. So that's why uh, I tend to land on avoiding the first person constructions in the footnotes. Uh, I don't know if that's a terribly pressing question or not, but it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting one for me. So I think that's all I had to say about um, visibility and invisibility and, and finding one's own balance between those two extremes or those two poles. Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Again, um, we have a, a couple minutes for any of the panelists who might want to respond to, to Tyler's um, talk. Or I would actually like to. I was, yeah. I was looking at Catherine. <laughs> <A few thoughts. laughs> we talked um, yesterday. Yeah, uh, a couple of things just about the question of making oneself known or not, and this is actually also in response to what Tom was saying just before Tyler started speaking. Um, the context of pretending or not pretending not to be there as, as a translator. I think. Um, in terms of the examples that Tom, that you were giving, like of using uh, perhaps language that would not be clearly not be something that a native speaker would say, to me that still fits within what I call the translator remaining invisible. Because what I what I mean when I say that is not that I would never use language that you know the Tibetan teacher I'm translating for would not use, but that I would try and use language that would represent. And of course, it's obviously I'm interceding because you intercede as a translator and you can't get beyond that. But using whatever language would seem most natural as if he or she were speaking in English. And that does involve, like in terms of figures of speech and so on, of course, m you know, my figures of speech are not Tibetan figures of speech as a native English speaker. So um, I think in that context, you know, even though I, what I'm talking about is invi invisibility, I guess here does involve things that also in some sense do make the presence of the translator very apparent. Um, and then just to what Tyler, you were mentioning about the use of the first person, I think that's a really interesting question. You were talking about it in terms of footnotes, but I was thinking, because I'm thinking about oral interpreting today, uh, as an oral interpreter, the use of the first person is a very interesting question um, because it's exactly the opposite. If you use the first person as an interpreter speaking for that other person, you are in some sense making yourself less visible. Um, and it can be hard, and it can be very awkward, especially when you're translating for your teacher, and there are so many thousands of ways in which I am not Chukini Mirbache, and the least of which is that I'm a woman and he's a man. I mean, just, you know, and, and so it, it's very, and in some instances in particular for me, that's so awkward. I do, I do it. I make myself do it. Um, but one particular instance for me that I found so difficult is when my teacher speaks about himself in very self-deprecating terms, and I just come up against a wall every time trying to translate for that. You know, at first I, I've, you know, I would, he would say I, blah, 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 blah. And I would say, well, sometimes we, and he called me out on it. Catherine, you are nice to me most of the time, but you are not doing a service, you know, in front of 150 people, sorry. <laughs> so then the next time it happened, I sort of, I think I switched to the third person because I just couldn't do it. Well, Rinpoche says that he's, you know, I just, and then finally I thought, you know, I think that as a methodology of an interpreter, I should speak in the first person. Uh, and so recently I tried to do that and I burst into tears. <laughs> so that didn't work either. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, it's just, it, it's an interesting question and there are situations where it's very difficult, actually, those, those questions of how to insert or not insert yourself. It's very difficult. Another interesting thing is slang. Yeah. You know, because sometimes, like, I'm really happy that I have an opportunity to talk about this. I didn't think I was going to get it, but um, uh, you know, Tibetan is such an earthy language, and English is in many ways fairly northerly language, like in the throat and in the head. Uh, but you have words like machupa in a like type Mahamudra type of context. That's very very earthy, and it's almost like if it, it's it feels like street talk almost. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a really earthy, folksy quality to it. But then in English, and I'm not criticizing or, or saying, because I, I say this too and I'll continue to say it, uh, so I'm not saying we need to change our ways or anything like that, but we say something like uncontrived, unfabricated, and so on. And those are really good for getting the meaning, but the feeling, mm -hmm. you, you, how do you get the feeling of ma jipa? So sometimes when I'm orally interpreted, Ting, depending on what the construction is, they'll say, like, 
so so some or something mm -hmm. like that, I'll say, don't mess with your mind, yeah. you know? And try to hit it on more of a slang way, and which is coming, I'm getting that from wherever I can from my own personal background, right? So in a sense, I'm kind of egoifying the translation, but in, in another sense, I feel like I'm more getting out of the way yeah. rather than changing the whole feel by saying, don't contrive or be free of contrivance, mm. you know? Um, and I feel like, this is the other thing that I wanted to make a plug for, is that we can learn a lot from like blues language and jazz language <laughs> and um, street slang in translating some of these experiential terms, I think. That, that more exploration should be done in that. <laughs> wow, okay, um, that's wonderful, thank you. Um, I, I don't have a segue into that, but that's okay. We, we're gonna move on to the fourth speaker. Um, um, the final speaker of this um, plenary session is Professor em Emeritus um, Tom Tillmans, who's the editor-in-chief of the 84,000 Project um, to translate Buddhist canonical literature. Um, <coughs> he has numerous publications and um, I am so excited to meet him uh, th this, through this panel, so I'm just gonna turn the floor over to him. Um, we did arrange the question, how far can we speak of rightness in translations? Is the problem of indeterminacy of translation a genuine problem? But I think we're gonna talk about even more than that, is my anticipation, we'll mm. see. Yeah, thank you very much. It's so nice to see so many people that I know here. Uh, and um, this is a very good uh, occasion to hash out a lot of issues that I don't think that there are any easy solutions to them, but it's always good to talk about them. <laughs> um, the question of rightness, uh, I guess that's my take on this formulation of whether translation is betrayal. No, I don't think translation is betrayal. I do think that we get things right sometimes. But what does that mean? <laughs> um, I gave a, perhaps a little bit of a hint uh, as to the complexity of the problem in, in, in a bit of my reply to Catherine and, uh, and, uh, and Gavin in terms of rep the complexity of what it is to represent somebody's thought uh, in terms of in mirroring their internal dialogue in some respects or to varying degrees interjecting one's own justified, hopefully, uh, information. Um, there are, uh, I'm not going to go into, in, in, into too many details of this, but uh, Catherine mentioned in, uh, in passing uh, the word truth value. Um, I think that in some ways meaning is not so important in translation. <laughs> word meaning is a type of obsession that many translators have, but truth is a lot more important. Let me explain myself. Suppose I say a me common metaphorical expression in, in French, le saut du coq à l'âne. And I translate that following the word meanings. I get he jumps from the rooster to the donkey. And um, you probably get the basic uh, gist of it, but a much more a much better translation would be to disregard the word meanings there and say, he jumps all over the place, or he goes all over the place. Um, there are many, many other examples of that type of thing where what counts in the translation is not the correspondence in word meanings, but the truth value. In other words, the truth conditions for he jumps all over the place basically would be the same that sentence would be true, taken in its metaphorical sense, obviously, uh, as you saw to Um So the truth value, if we get, for example, to some of our technical cases, uh, the truth value of using some term like contraposition or the law of double negation and elimination, those sentences will remain true in a way in which, uh, that is, they'll represent the Sanskrit sentences, that is, they will be true when the Sanskrit sentences are true, and they'll be false when the Sanskrit sentences are false. So that's what I'm putting the emphasis on in terms of truth value. But again, that's not actually really what I want to talk about too much. Uh, I've been involved, of course, with the 84,000, uh, but I've also been involved in, in a number of uh, philosophical projects. 
uh, one of which is uh, a rather an odd one. Um, um, the professor of logic, uh, Johann von Bentham, in the um, University of Amsterdam, and he also has a chair in Stanford, um, uh, put together a history of Chinese logic. He's also interested in the history of, of logic in different cultures. And uh, so I'm involved in that, and that's given me the chance to deal with a number of sinologists, notably people like Christoph Harbsmeyer and Chad Hansen, um, some of the Hong Kong crowd. And uh, I'm not looking at it so much from the point of view of the Chinese, I'm looking at it from the point of view of the Tibetan, but from the point of view of the Tibetan as part of the Sino-Tibeto, Tibetan family of languages. Okay, what arises in this kind of context is a problem of mass nouns and count nouns. Mass nouns being things like snow, where you don't say one snow or two snows. Uh, count nouns being ones where you do uh, have uh, numerals and plurals, and certain adjectives are used with count nouns and aren't used with mass nouns and so forth. And there's a hypothesis in Chinese called the mass noun hypothesis, which is that Chinese has predominantly mass nouns. And indeed, uh, uh, people have followed up on that and they say, you know, in effect, you can take any common noun in Chinese and turn it into a mass noun. In other words, you can say, Zai chi li yo ma, there's a horse here. Huh? There's horse here. Uh, or Zai chi li yo xue, here there's water. These are all mass nouns. Ma, they're taken as a mass noun. Or you can say, yi pi ma, one horse, right? Now, Hansen has really privileged this mass noun hypothesis. Uh, what I wanted to do was look at it in Tibetan and see whether any kind of mass noun hypothesis uh, works in Tibetan. I think it does. I don't go so far as Hansen on questions of in a sense, Chinese way of thinking, or Tibetan way of thinking dictated by the language. But what I did come up with was a number of Tibetan writers who interpreted their own language in a way in which a type of mass, the mass nouns were really privileged. In other words, I'm not talking about intrinsic features of the Tibetan language, but I'm talking about certain writers on logic and on semantics and their view of Tibetan. And this, in particular, I'm talking about the Gelugpa. <laughs> various sentences, various problems that come up in Gelugpa logic texts. It receives the somewhat bombastic name of the supreme difficult point of the Apolha theory. Um, it figures in um, Tsongkhapa, it figures in Gyaltsabje, not surprisingly it figures in all sorts of commentaries and it figures in Dura. And it basically is the type of thing that you see represented in the handout in two uh, the first two, uh, well, the, the two examples, unfortunately I've got the wrong glasses on so I can't even see my own hand up. Um, where we have, in Tibetan it's Mabo Mayimba Church and Tapa Yimba Tao, Kyo Tapa Tan Shito Yue So non-red is permanent because there are common bases between permanent and it. Now, this is really impenetrable. Huh? The second one is Hold on to your hats. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know it too. <laughs> okay, what's going on in this type of situation? Well, we have a problem of how to translate this type of a context. These people take this very seriously. That is, this is a reflection of the type of thing that they call the supreme difficult point. Hmm? They take it very seriously. We're forced 
to translate, for example, in the second example, with a, in italics, showing that actually it's rather bad English. <laughs> yeah. We should be talking about defining characteristics because it's a count noun, but we're treating it as if it's a mass noun, right? And then, you, so you start saying, and I certainly had these conversations with the friends, I said, well, what's going on here? I don't really even understand the church in, you know? And they said, it's tseni rando, mm -hmm. it's tseni kora, mm -hmm. it's just defining characteristic itself. Where that would make sense to me if someone was talking about snow itself, water itself, but it doesn't make sense to me when I'm talking about defining characteristic itself. Now, you start thinking, hey, wait a minute, can I paraphrase this away? Can I say they're not talking about defining characteristic itself, whatever that might mean, mm -hmm. but they're talking about defining characteristic hood the abstract property of being a defining characteristic, or some defining characteristics, or all defining characteristics. Well, in fact, if you take some defining characteristics, or all, it comes out false. You don't preserve truth value, which is the mark of a bad translation. <laughs> um, in other contexts, perhaps it's not so apparent here, uh, for example, if you have Bumba Chen. Vase, taking that as the subject, is bulbous, splay-bottomed, and able to perform the function of carrying water. <laughs> now, if you substituted for that vasness, the abstract universal, universals don't carry water. They're abstract ideas. Sets don't carry water. Concepts don't carry water, that type of thing. So you're really, in a sense, between a rock and a hard place here. <laughs> you're faced with a problem of faithfulness, and hence solacistic English, <laughs> which you have to render in my clumsy fashion with italics, or you are faced with actually seriously deforming the line of thought. In other words, to go back to my truth value stuff, having a, Tibet, a sentence which is regarded as true in Tibetan come out false or vice versa. Okay, this I think is getting to a problem of untranslatability. In other words, we have the question, what does it mean to get things right? Hopefully we get things right in some explicable way. Uh, but we also seem to have cases where we just can't get things right in that full sense of having the English right and the thought right. <laughs> uh, in some sense, we don't know what we're talking about. It's incomprehensible, okay? This untranslatability. Now, some people might want to say, and this is Chad Hansen who had do it with Chinese, he would want to say, yes, yes, you're, you're getting the problem. You know, Chinese people think really very differently and so forth. There's a kind of Chinese logic. Um, it reminds one a little bit of the old Benjamin Lee Whorf types of hypotheses of each language embodying a metaphysic, uh, a, 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 a way of carving up the world uh, uh, and so forth. I don't want to go that far. I don't want to say, as I said before, I don't want to say that this is an intrinsic problem of Tibetan or of Chinese. I think in many, many, many cases in Tibetan, you can take mass nouns and translate them in terms of count nouns, you know. Mota yore, car exists, or, you know. But you say, there are cars. That's banal, right? car, many, there are lots of cars. <laughs> These are banal cases, but the interesting thing about this is that it's not paraphrasable in that oh-so-common fashion for translators. So where are we at? Because 
uh, I suspect I'm going to run out of time quite soon, we're faced with a problem that analytic philosophers generally dislike which is because they fear that it's going to go in the direction of Benjamin Lee Wharf and so forth, uh, and a, a certain type of linguistic mysticism. Um, I'm not going in that direction, but I'm not going in the direction of Donald Davidson either. Donald Davidson wrote a rather influential article on the very idea of a conceptual scheme, where he argued that there was no such thing, or we couldn't, in a sense, even talk about the foreignness or lack of it, of a conceptual scheme which was so radically different from us that they didn't share a large number of truths. Now, of course, you have conceptual schemes. You have cultures which believe certain things that we don't. Uh, but basically what Davidson is ruling out is the kind of Martian example uh, uh, of people that are, in a sense, so different from us that we can't even articulate uh, where the differences lie, how great they are, and so forth. I'm not going that way. In other words, to put it in another way, I'm not talking about necessary or essential untranslatability. I'm talking about a type of de facto untranslatability. But it is a serious one. It's a serious one when you're dealing with philosophical texts. Let's look at types of untranslatability, and I'll conclude on that. Um, the Minoan language in the alphabet, linear A, is at this particular point untranslatable. We can, however, imagine a complement or a supplement to our knowledge which would make it so hieroglyphics between, before Jean-François Ch Champollion uh, deciphered the Rosetta Stone were incomprehensible. But after the Rosetta Stone, uh, we have people who are quite comfortable reading hieroglyphics. These are cases of complements of information rendering previously untranslatable languages uh, intelligible. Now, this isn't the case here. I don't think that we're waiting for a complement of information, another text, a Rosetta Stone, or another Tumo Mayimpe Menga, another special oral teaching, which is going to clarify this thing. This thing is here to stay. Is it necessary? That is, is it true in all? Is it a necessary truth or essential? No, I don't think so. Uh, I would only talk about necessary uh, untranslatability if you had the scenario of structures, of intrinsic structures of a language which made it impossible to translate. In other words, the wharf scenario. Now, this isn't that either, but it is a serious problem. In other words, it's a serious problem where we don't see a way out. Uh, it may be in the future that people will learn to talk in this way, that analytic philosophers will start to study Dura, and that vase will become a, ma a mass noun in, in, in English, and that everybody will cheerfully go on. Uh, and this, I think that's quite improbable. Uh, and I just don't see the reasoning as, as to how it's going to happen. So what kind of situation are we in? We're in a situation of divided minds. We're in a situation of where I think Gavin or anyone who's done these kind of studies say, I can explain this stuff persuasively in Tibetan to Tibetans. And yet, to my philosophy colleagues in English, I can't get it across at all, right? And in some sense, I understand it in Tibetan. I know how to make all the right moves. Mm -hmm. And I know the justifications, right? And yet, I don't have any of that type of resource in English. In other words, I think that there are serious cases in the translation of Tibetan uh, where we end up with a divided mind with no clear bridge. I'll just toss out as another example, medical stuff. Uh, try explaining and having a dialogue on Lung, Chiba, and Beijing, 
uh, with a, uh, a diehard uh, uh, doctor at the University of Lausanne Hospital. Uh, we have an institute at the University of Lausanne which tries to make the bridges uh, between Asian medicine and, uh, and it's a similar problem. It really doesn't get very far. So that's what I have to say. Um, before we open it up uh, to the audience to ask questions, we still have a little time for Tom, if you guys have any questions or for Tom directly. So, um, definition, right? If you, if you use def definition, a definition is not a definition, because if it was, what is it, the definition? Definition is not a definition because it's a defiend, defiendum, something to be defined. Does that not get around the problem? You've turned them both into count nouns. Uh, no, you, you need a definition, or yes. some definitions, or all definitions. Mm -hmm. right? Definition is not like snow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just say <laughs> definition on its own. Take a, uh, take well, a you, can, you can make that move, but... Okay, definition is not a definition, is it? Because it, if it is, it's not the definition of anything. So definition is not a definition, because it is something that needs to be defined. Okay. That don't work? Well, do you think it works? <laughs> works in Tibetan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As you say, yeah, it works yeah, in Tibetan. It, works. it does. <laughs> it works beautifully in Tibetan. Let's look at it this way. You know, take another one. Um, you know, one which you know too. Bumba chuchen. Chi in batao. De. De segurwa. De. Chi in de? Kela jada yubichir. Tatare. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, so the, uh, if you take, uh, okay, I'm going to translate here a little bit pidgin English. Huh? Take vase as the subject. It is a universal. Why? Because it has, in a sense, subtypes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, let's suppose that we wanted to make that more acceptable English, because vase is a universal, is not acceptable English. Mm -hmm. You've been in India too long if you, if you. Vase, what you can say is a vase, some vase, all vases. Vasness is a universal, but all of those will come out as either, uh, will come out as, 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 uh, uh, well, with one exception, uh, vase, nurse. Uh, the other ones will come out not preserving truth value. Right. You can't say, I prefer pot, by the way. I mean, well, <laughs> oh, I, I came Actually, out wrong. You <laughs> yeah, you're in Colorado. I came out wrong there, but. <laughs> um, Colorado. We are in Colorado. <laughs> definition of, the definition of uh, Bumba is something with a, a flat bottom, and the end. that's a pot, right? It's one of those clay pot things. Anyway. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> What about, you know, um, mud, a clay pot is jada, right, of, uh, of, uh, of bumba, right? Sure. So a clay pot is a specific or a, how did you translate it, subtype? A specific or a particular mm. of a pot. Yeah. Is it not? It's a particular, it's a kind well, of subspecies. Of a pot. Subspecies. subspecies. Sub subtype. Okay, so a, p a clay pot is a subspecies or a subtype or a particular of a pot. Is that a, what, what's wrong with that? Well, because when you're saying a pot, you're saying, you know, I'm indefinite saying definite. I'm not saying the pot, I'm yeah, saying, you're saying a, a pot. Some pot or another. And that's not the point. Pot. You know, it's not the point that some, that it's, it's, it's a subtype of some pot or another. You know, some particular instance that you might find over there, you might find it over here, but uh, of a universal. In other words, pot or vase is doing the work there that in Sanskrit, you do with gatatva, mm -hmm. you, you know, vasness, right? But, as we know, in Tibetan, they don't use bumpa ni. Mm -hmm. They use bumpa. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, po the problem lies. If they had, in a sense, been, how can I put it, good little apohavadans, <laughs> and just, and talked about bumpa ni, <laughs> Then you, you don't get that problem. 
think uh, we need to switch gears. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to let the audience ask some yeah. questions. So it is that time. Um, I, uh, yeah. Oh my God, questions. <laughs> that was fun. Um, so I have two, actually two questions, one for the interpreter and one for translators in general. So as an interpreter, when it's obvious that the speaker is wrong, yeah. what do you do? Yeah. Right? Or when he says blah, 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 and so on. And the audience doesn't know what so on is. Yeah. What do you do? Mm -hmm. And for Tyler, I'm not so sure how invisible a translator, a translator can be. OK. Because <laughs> if I read Pia Makara material, Oh, I know it's Pierre Macaron material. If I read Jeffrey Hopkins' translation, sure. oh, I know it's from Jeffrey Hopkins. <laughs> <laughs> There's sure. no doubt. For sure. Right? For sure. Where is your invisibility? You can tell. You know, pick this one, that one, that one. You can tell who did that work. Totally. Mm. Would you like to start off on the um, I, I what will, do you do when but I would I, I am the reason I one of the reasons I wanted to talk about interpreting is because there are several other interpreters up here so I will answer but I would like it if you guys would also say something um, when someone says when the teacher says something that is wrong uh, if it is a very very small thing like he says the first paramita is discipline and I know he knows that is not the case then I correct if it's something that I know is just a slip of the tongue. If it is something that um, I think is incorrect and I think he has actually made a mistake, I ask. I say, hey, you know, Kempo, la, isn't it like this instead? And if he still insists, then he, whatever he's, he, I'm just saying what he says. So I will say things that I don't believe are true as an interpreter. I have done this in the past. I will do it again. Um, <laughs> 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 if the teacher says la sopa and I don't think the audience knows what is included in the et cetera, I say et cetera because he said et cetera or she said et cetera. And um, it's his or her call. I mean, he or she is also sees who's in the audience. And if they wanted to name all six paramitas, they would. And if they didn't want to, they didn't want to. And so I don't, right. I don't. So and that's just my. The only way I differ is because sometimes it's a very, it's a very personal relationship, and mm -hmm. you know each other, and they, you know that they expect certain things of you. Yeah. So I, I have a situation where my teacher expects me to fill in the las sopas, yeah. to fill in the and so ons, and not only that, but you know, he, he, he expects me sometimes to, he's like, so there's this point in which involves this and this, right? And he kind of like it's a little bit of a wink and a nod thing, like you need to say Elaborate, this and this. I'm not yeah. going to say that but I'm, I'm just going to side reference it now, but you should say the whole thing, mm -hmm. you know, but th that's understood in terms of personal relationship as well. Yeah. So that's a big part of it sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, and then ab absolutely correct. There's no real invisibility and, and, and you know, uh, Tom and I hashed that out a little bit yesterday. <coughs> it's only a pretense of invisibility. Uh, in the end, you, you, can't, you can't achieve the real invisibility, but sometimes the pretense can be beneficial, um, just in terms of the the type of uh, the type of uh, information chunks you're putting into the space. Back and forth, I guess. So on the side. Yeah, this is mo mostly for Tyler. Um, when I teach my university students text uh, Tibetan or Sanskrit, I and I need to use translations. I generally use two translations for any yeah. given text, so that oh. all the problems of translation are apparent. Mm -hmm. Almost always, the students resist this vigorously. They want to know, why does the world have to be so complicated? Why do you complicate everything? They really want this simple, direct relation with the Buddha or with the teacher. Yeah. But that's a just-so story. That's a what? A just so story. It's uh -huh. a. It's a. It, we're not doing justice to to truth, let, let alone scholarship. Yes. By by pandering to their laziness. Right. <laughs> so, I fight them, and evaluations <laughs> suffer. <laughs> yeah. But but I'm not giving in, uh, and and I think 
I, I think there's too much to gain by realizing that they have responsibilities, especially in this tradition where the negative dialectics is a central part of it. Yeah. Totally agree, and especially in an academic context, that, that you know, uh, I couldn't see any other way to do it than, than make the diversity of the options of translations available and known, and, and even to work on, uh, work with using two different translations is, it could only be, uh, I, I, at the same time, I understand the urge to just keep things simple um, in a certain context, but if it's, a, if it's an academic context, if it's a context that's encouraging the quality of intellectual rigor, then I wouldn't see how you, you can't be anything but served by looking at multiple translations. <coughs> and problematizing these sure. issues that, of course, does take them away from, from, from the text, but that's a dream that... Yes. That's yes. right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you all. So I'm really happy that music is coming up a lot, um, especially since the Buddha is said to have taught in 60 melodies. And uh, so different genres, formats of music. Uh, and it really made me think the more we can put the English into chantable, metric English for the root texts, so that's how it's memorized in the Sanskrit and the Tibetan, and the, also to put the liturgies into singable, or the songs into singable, because that's how we all memorize as kids, and so Memorization is how do you get it into your blood, and how do we get it into our children, and that's transmission. So we're a very geeky crowd and really stick to the literal and the meaning and the true translations, but how do we actually sing it? So that's my encouragement to all of us to have some aspiration. Of course, we want to get the meaning correct, but how do we get it into the bloodstream? Well, now I'm doing um, the, the eight great uh, texts, you know, the eight great folk, folk operas, and they are all they are all in verse, but it's it's colloquial, and they're all to be sung, and uh, all human emotion is there. Um, it is pain, anguish, joy, laughter, pain of separation, and everything, and it's all verse. It's all it's all to be sung, and. Um, it's syllabic, but I mean, I think, you know, uh, quite some time ago, I mean, in the, in the uh, we decided that uh, it's impossible to reproduce things in syllabic, you know, like seven syllables to each line, because I mean, I know I, some people have done that, I think, um, yeah, people have done that, but I think free verse works as well. Uh, uh, free verse can be poetic and can lend itself to scanning and flowing if it's done well. You know, and I go back to Angulimala I, for that, mm -hmm. you know, that story. He, that guy taught me how to tell a story or how to say something. And it, it, it's something you want to remember, you want to remember, you want it inside of you. It's not, oh my God, I can't, you know, memorize this, but it just, I can remember every, almost every word of every Dylan song. Right, you know? right, exactly. I can. Maybe because I was young, but uh, you know, just something that, you know, and even now I listen to it and it's just, you know, it's magic. So yeah, I agree totally. We, we need some magic. Yeah, yeah it doesn't have to be <laughs> metric, but it has no, to be singable. not metric, but magic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in the other part, uh, since this was a big topic, was allegiance and invisibility getting out of the way. Um, number of times, Venerable Trang Rinpoche, and his Dharma brother, Venerable Chiki Gyatso, said, um, it's not about me, it's about the Dharma. So that was their allegiance, even though they are yeah. incredibly visible, flamboyant people, just as we are. So <laughs> no, yeah, I agree, it's, yeah. that's, mm -hmm. in terms of allegiance, maybe that's something to think about. Yeah, it's a, ser it's a service. It's an art. Translation is an art, I feel. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, thank you for, for bringing in the, the term art or even craft. Um, I want, obviously, this question of visibility and invisibility is a really hot topic. And I just wanted to bring in Lawrence Venuti, who's a theorist who's really brought this um, to the fore and the invisibility of the translator. And his critique really is that a fluid translation masks the work of the translator, the creative work, the art, the agency, and that actually it's impossible to translate without interpreting. Um, and and in, in effect, by, by, by trying to, uh, so you could say a fluid translation is a literary effect, or at worst, a mystification, where you're, where you're providing a kind of, attempting to provide a direct access to the original that's impossible. And he really sees it as a violation, so I'm just, I'm just trying to be a little provocative because we're all, you know, just to be devil's advocate. But he says, um, by producing the illusion of transparency, a fluent translation masquerades as true semantic equivalence when it in fact inscribes the foreign text with a partial interpretation, partial to English language values, reducing if not simply excluding the very difference that translation is called on to convey. So actually he, he sees this as a sort of like that we should be challenging the values of the target language and that, that that could actually be a greater service to the original sources than to simply uh, create a translation that's so easily digestible that it actually has taken away the rhetorical force of the text or the speaker themselves. So that's just offered as a comment. Yes, well, I don't know if this relates to what you were just saying, but um, one thing I wanted to say is that, is that in my discussion of visibility versus invisibility, I, I was trying not to say that one side's better than the other, and I, I'm more trying to say that invisibility is a pretense in some degree, but there might be some practical use of trying to go for that or pretending that you're going for that. Um, but what strikes me, at, like what you just said about now, may, might relate to this problem I always keep coming back to, which is uh, the passive voice, which Tibetan loves. Mm. And English, is, it just sounds terrible if you, if you construct so many things in the passive voice, like Drola Penchir Sangye Drupar Shols. May Buddhahood be achieved. <laughs> 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 you know, you can't get any, anywhere with that. So um, you're not really, so it, does that relate to you think the way you're saying? So I always want to put, and that's where I personally think the happy medium is relying on brackets. I always want to put sentences in an active voice and hopefully I can find what the subject of the sentence is, which is always not said in the Tibetan, and then put that in the brackets so it reads as an active construction. Uh, and, um, is that an example of maybe challenging, or what, what did you say, challenging the values of the source language or yeah. the target language? Actually, the, I'm sorry, oh, the target language. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay. But actually, I think what you're speaking to is exactly the kind of intervention we do all the time. Yeah. And to own that intervention and actually right. take it as a creative task yeah. rather than simply, you know, as if we could be a, a sort of clear conduit. Right. Um, you know, so then we could, once, once you admit you're not a clear conduit, then you can start to ask, well, what are the creative tasks? Which I think is, you know, the interesting question that we could take up here. Yes. I mean, I think it's clear that we're, we're not, a, tr a translator is not a clear conduit. And I, I guess I assume that the readership and the audience is intelligent enough to know that. <laughs> and so I don't think it's a violation to try and make it fluid because they, I mean, if I'm interpreting, they see me. They see that Rimshe is not speaking in English and that I'm speaking. And if they're reading a translation, I, I mean, I guess I assume that the readership will also think about that. And <coughs> it is also a responsibility to make something accessible, which to me is fluid, just to, you know, give a contraposition to that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think there's different ways of thinking about it. We have, like, just five more minutes, so let's um, maybe try to, yeah, uh, get the questions on the floor. Okay. Thank you. Um, that was a really interesting panel and many really interesting issues came up. I just wanted to make two points and one is just really a comment also on this whole issue of the, of becoming invisible. I would just like to add, you know, yes, it's true that you never can be completely invisible, but the gesture of trying to be invisible 
might be very significant in and of itself. And I think one of the things that the translator is doing, especially in, in the oral translation, but maybe also in the textual case too, is being a model for the readers on how to read a text. Mm -hmm. And so you're wrestling with the, the problem of your own ideas and, and opinions interfering with what the teacher is saying and you're sort of modeling that I'm going to try to bracket those and I'm really going to try to say what the teacher is saying mm -hmm. is a, a, a kind of pathway for the audience to also realize that they have to work really hard to try to get what the teacher is saying. So I'm just trying to get to that dimension of, of the effort to be invisible even though the very act of being invisible is made visible by its saliency and that actually has something to do with what Holly was saying. The other is a more, uh, a slightly cr critical comment, and, and Sarah uh, credited me with yelling at her about using the word intention this morning. And not that I don't understand, you know, and the whole idea of intention is a very complicated one. But one of the things I didn't hear in what you guys were talking about today, maybe I just missed it, was there's a kind of presumption that when an author has an idea or an intention, that there's a kind of transparency between that and what actually ultimately gets written. And I, I think we all know that when we try to write something, the way that the language gets away from, and sometimes the language kind of changes what you think that you're saying, and it's not just a one-way street as if there's intention here and then the text you know, is a kind of second product out of that. And so I, th I think that's really important to take into account that often that's why people are trying to let the text itself speak for itself and what it's saying. I just want to say one more thing about the music example. Once again, um, you know, how did Mozart perform uh, whatever it is that we're talking about? I'm just thinking of uh, how struck I was by seeing Bob Dylan, who also was mentioned. He has, you know, some of his great classic songs. Every time he performs them, he performs them differently. Right. And so which is the right way to perform it? Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Um, do you want to comment on that or take questions? Um, which is the right way? Well, if you take one text and you give it to two or three different translators, they're all going to come out with slightly, you know, variants, because they all think this is the right way uh, that he did. But that, is, that, uh, that wasn't the point I was making. The, the point was about uh, the allegiance to, the, uh, to Mozart. Of course so. Uh, the pianist might not get it right. And of course, he, he was not there, so he can't know. But he tries as best as he can in his own, with his own skill and his own, you know, with his own skill to do that. And that's all he can do. And uh, that's the point I was making. <clears throat> this is also just following on the same theme of invisibility, visibility, agency, the uh, notion that there is a text or a teacher and then there's a translator or an oral interpreter and there's kind of a, a flow that's moving through there. And I wanted to raise, which is again also coming up in what Holly said and what Janet just said, the notion of patience in terms of the translator or the oral interpreter. How is it that we are being worked on by the text that we encounter or allow ourselves to encounter? What kind of an encounter is that and what does that what kind of um, change or willingness to change is found in the, in the person of each one of us in this room who is engaging in those practices? And how does that then work to um, affect what we do with the written translation or the oral interpretation that is given out to the room of students? Because I think that there's that element of responsibility that comes in on our sides and our willingness and openness to be affected by what we encounter when we open ourselves to these texts and to these teachers seems fundamental to me somehow in what we do with them in the world and what the product is that comes out into the space. And I just feel like that's an issue that is implicit in everything that's being said but hasn't been explicitly brought to the surface and I'd love to hear more discussion of it. Maybe there'll be quite a bit of it tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. It's, I, I know there's three minutes left, so thank you so much for the comment. But I think we're just going to go and get the audience kind of feedback, and then uh, and then see how much time we have left. Go ahead. We'll get to the question. And Both uh, in the Sanskrit and the uh, Tibetan tradition, 
many authors, when they wrote uh, very difficult uh, philosophical texts, then wrote their own auto-commentaries to the texts and uh, explained them. And I'm wondering if, uh, when we're dealing with translation of these very difficult terse texts, that uh, as translators, now I'm arguing for the side of extreme visibility of the uh, translator, that uh, if we make a translation just of the text, as in your example of vase, it comes out unintelligible. Or if you do that with uh, a lot of the very difficult uh, philosophical texts of Tsongkhapa, etc., it's unintelligible because it's filled with jargon. But uh, what do you think of the idea of the translator putting themselves out on the line and writing an auto-commentary to their own translation so that they explain, and they're not pretending that it's somebody else's uh, version, but they're explaining what, at least in their understanding, is of the text, which then informs people of how they're translating it. Because if you just translate the text by itself, as I said, in most cases, it's totally unintelligible. Is there any, uh, a quick, yes. very, very quick responses? I think that's an excellent idea. And it's, it's absolutely necessary in a lot of texts. Uh, you know, in a sense, the, the really technical philosophical stuff, you've got to unpack it. Mm. Uh, is there, the text doesn't just speak for itself. I think exactly. we agree on that. And footnotes don't make it for that. Uh, well, it footnotes are, are better than nothing. Better than nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a small observation in terms of some of the things Catherine was talking about. Uh, in oral translation, I find that people tend to ask questions with a lot of buzzwords in them, things like anger, love, attachment, self. And I think it is my duty both to the audience and to the teacher to really, one, find out what specific meaning the audience is referring to, and then also to let them know when the teacher responds in Tibetan the specific linguistic range of meanings of what I'm translating if they're talking about, quote, attachment. I may not be talking about attachment as used in psychotherapy, but I might be talking about a very sticky. So I put myself quite in the middle of translation because I think both the teacher and the audience need a lot of help in understanding one another. And all of these buzzwords have created so much misunderstanding between students and Tibetan teachers. Could I just respond very quickly to that? I, I absolutely agree. And I think I didn't mention question and answer, but that's one of the most difficult, mm -hmm. uh, but also most important parts of an oral interpreter's role. And uh, I do exactly the same thing that you're suggesting. When people use a word that sometimes that word doesn't exist in Tibetan, and I'm going to tell them that I cannot translate that word, but I will explain it like this. And then I tell them what in English what I'm going to say in Tibetan, and, and vice versa. Because I think, and in that case, you, I feel that you absolutely just have to make very obvious your role in interceding between that kind of thing. Because, yes, people ask questions about, I mean, just, it's, there's, yeah. <laughs> doesn't always work. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're all getting tired. <laughs> Thank you to the panelists today. And um, I look forward to see how this conversation goes um, with all of these like wonderful suggestions and comments, especially when it comes to the transmission aspect of this, which we purposely did not really touch on the, the topic of change and transmission because we kind of wait until tomorrow for that. So thank you. I think um, uh, Marcus has some Thanks comments. Thanks so much. That was wonderful.